Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dick Fearman on the iPharma 2020 Goes Digital platform. I'm sitting here with Peter van Bodegom, Peter van Bodegom in Dutch. He is the professor of environmental biology at the Institute of Environmental Sciences at the University of Leiden. And his colleague is Koos Biesmeyer. He is a professor or the professor of something we're going to talk about, natural capital. What is that? And this interview results from the first interview I did with Peter on natural capital accounting, as Peter had criticism on the notion introduced by Barry Martin from Bravo Bank. Uh, he wanted to do not true costing, but nature costing. And then Peter said, we need to talk about nature profiting as well. Now, how to do that? Because there is a whole framework being developed in science, and it now needs to be put into practice. Coach, what is this natural capital accounting? What is it? Well, that's a good question. Uh, in the formal sense, it's uh, just taking um, um, the balances of natural nature services into account in your in your costing, in your budgets, whatever. Uh, but phrased simpler, it's just um, um, being aware of what nature can contribute to our lives and to our economies. So any company, government, organization, whatever, should take nature and its services into account in, uh, in the balances and books for the future. So it's a whole, it, 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 it's, a gr it, it's a green approach to the economy. I would say it's a normal approach to economy. It's just that uh, the economy till now has not taken into account all the benefits and all the all the costs of it. And so it's a bit strange to call it natural cap. It's well, you call it, could call it natural capital accounting because it's a natural way. It should be the natural way to accounting, because it takes into account not only what we produce and how we produce it, but also the costs and benefits of the environment. Okay, I, I can understand that. It is the normal way, but it's, 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 it's kind of a new normal because we've, we never did it. We yep. always used, we've used nature to our benefits. And this notion is, well, is in a way using nature to our common benefit yep. of, of mankind and nature. Big companies tell us all the time that indeed they want to do green. They want to be green. How can they do that? Taking up this natural notion of natural capital. What do they need to do, Coach? Well, they have to see nature as an asset and a potential asset. And it's not only be based on money, but on value. For example, a simple example. I've, I've worked on pollinators a long time. And in... That's one of the simplest examples where you can show that a visit by a single bee on an apple flower produces an apple, which has a value to the apple grower and to our economy. So there you have a direct link from nature to the products you produce. So as soon as the apple farmers and the other uh, crop growers understand that there's a benefit from pollinators or from natural enemies of, the, of their pests, but pollinators is very clear, if they are aware of the benefit of pollinators, then they have to care for what the pollinators need, which is the environment. And it's often much cheaper than, once they realize it, to create a good environment for pollinators that boosts their population so that they can provide the pollination service. And that pollination service, of course, we've also tried to, uh, to uh, add it up the value of it, and it's probably between the 250 and 500 billion euros a year just for marketable goods, the value. And in the Netherlands, for example, 50% of the values of apples, pears, strawberries, blueberries is due to pollination. So once you realize that as a grower, then you can do two things. You can either ignore it and find a technical solution, or you can work with nature, with the environment, to produce the goods that you need for your products. And you say it's a very natural approach. Um, and now you make it sound very, very understandable. You would be mad uh, bringing in uh, all kinds of drones to pollinate. Yes. Just, just let pollinators do the job and it's, it's, it's cheaper. Um, 
wh- how come we didn't do that? How come we're still creating new technology, and especially here in Wageningen, I'm sitting in Aden next to Wageningen, here in, 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 in Wageningen, we're still going strong on more technology in order to get uh, ammonia, for example, out of, out of stables in, in animal husbandry. You can do that in the natural way. How come we're still on a different path? Because the, um, uh, there's several reasons, of course, for that. Um, first, there's not a common currency. So it's not, it's not easy to express all these benefits from nature and also the costs on the, of nature um, in, terms of, in, in uh, financial terms. That's a bit more difficult. The second thing is that the supply and demand is often in very different places. So if, if all the services from nature would occur at the, different, at the same farm as where the apples are grown, then it's, it's one system for the grower. But often that's not the case. So for example, the risk of uh, flooding or drought or contribu- positive contributions to nature occur in areas adjacent to the, gr- to the crop growing areas. So you have to work with your neighbors and with the whole landscape. And that's more difficult as well. So there's several reasons why that is, has not been included so much. And it's not accidental that I, uh, that I talk about bees, because I always talk about bees. No, also because that's one of the examples where you can really express the behavior of these animals almost in dollars and euros, if you want. In many other cases, it's, not, it's, it's more difficult because the benefits are more indirect, are, are not even... Uh, easily expressible in terms of uh, are easily expressible in terms of value but not in money and given that our economy runs on money as a as the common currency that makes it a bit more complex as well now but this is interesting because why didn't we do it we don't we don't see the whole system yeah in fact that's what you're saying if you're not aware of the whole system you'll let go and you'll you'll optimize only one aspect of it yeah um, and bringing in this, this notion of a, a common uh, denominator, a one currency, will make you aware of, of what you can do. I mean, if companies are to, to work in this, in, 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 in this way of thinking, of green, of natural capital, of creating natural capital, they'll need to work together because yep. together they are the system how, as you are this professor of natural capital, it's an organizational challenge, probably. Is that true? Oh, yes, it's uh, definitely an organizational challenge because uh, given that the supply and demand of these services occur in different places often, you need to find part- different partners than you normally have in your value change or in your production change. And the second thing is also that you have to think in the long term. So the benefits will not occur tomorrow. So if you invest, for example, in pollinators in your landscapes, that may take two years. But once you have invested and you, and you after two years, we know then the benefits are much higher than, than all your technical fix, fixes in the short term. So if you go for short term solutions, it's harder to make the case for nature. But for the long term, it's very easy to make the case for nature. As you know, palm oil is, uh, is producing far more oil per hectare than, than, than other oily seeds. Yet we are against it because it ruins the, the, the uh, Urang Utan um, uh, habitats in, in Indonesia. Uh, we need the oil somehow. Um, suppose now that Unilever would approach you and ask you, how are we going to create natural capital in oily seeds, given the fact that palm oil is more efficient to produce than soil, soil, uh, soil, fr- soil from, from South America, for example? How, how would you respond to that very difficult question? May I respond to that one? Yeah, you may respond to that as well, yes. Um, I think it is cheaper to produce because basically they don't take the cost into account. Uh, uh, um, The environmental cost, the carbon losses, the the biodiversity losses, etc. 
Of course, there are also quite a, f a few biodiversity losses involved if you do soy, but, but well, uh, uh, if you don't take those costs into account, it, it indeed may, may seemingly be, be cheaper. So that's if, if you would do the true costing, true pricing type of approach. Mm -hmm. If you look at more from a, a, a um, well, true profit point of view, then I would say, okay, uh, I'm thinking about uh, uh, palm oil production, but how can you combine that with the preservation of biodiversity? So how can you do palm oil production without continuing to cut down the rainforest? How can you do that um, with sort of less drainage of the peatlands uh, and, and therefore the, the, the loss of carbon? Uh, or how could you make sure that actually you, you sequester the carbon uh, um, and, and not lo losing them. Um, so if, if you are thinking about it from a natural capital point of view, indeed your your business model would be a quite a different business model for the RMO because you would take all those natural capital components into account as well. Um, which would probably lead to different rotations because currently palm oil rotations take about 20 years and then it, it's not sustainable anymore and they move forward. So if you think about it from a natural capital point of view, you would make sure that also after a rotation, you can still stay at the same location to continue uh, uh, doing uh, your palm oil production in a sustainable way to avoid uh, uh, additional costs. Um, so I, I, to my point of view, if you are really critical about sustainable palm oil, you should make sure that the sustainability certification truly takes into account the various natural capitals that are involved in your production system, which is currently not the case in, in the current certification of palm oil. Yeah. Right. So it's, and that's a societal challenge as well then. Eh? So there in the value chain and in society we for example as, as the netherlands we could we could say well we only want palm oil which is produced above a certain degree of incorporating natural capital or um so that's what we're trying to do in the netherlands for example for dairy farming eh? there's a kind of a, a system where you can uh, kind of a monitor for biodiversity where based on all kind of uh, data farmers can or dairy farmers can be assessed in how positive they are for biodiversity. And then the bank already, the Rabobank already gives um, interest rate uh, rebate of a half a percent to some of these dairy farmers that produce at a higher level. So then it's not um, a directly a business model for the farmer itself, but in, within the chain, it becomes a business model because supermarkets give a couple of cents more for your milk or the banks give you uh, lower interest rates, or the water boards uh, do that, or nature organizations uh, pay, for, pay for it or whatever. So then, again, it's not about the direct money of the business itself, but more about how the value chain is linked to the societal challenges. And with palm oil, that's, of course, quite a challenge, because then it has, I think it's important then also for Malaysia, Indonesia, and other countries, to be aware of the long-term negative effects of uh, the current uh, uh, procedures and, and growing uh, practices, and then put, uh, put some measures in place to, to change that. Right. In Costa Rica for a long time, and then you have a lot of palm oil, and that's, uh, it's funny because they used to have cocoa on the whole coast, and then the disease came in. Oh, then they had uh, uh, bananas for 20 years. And then the banana companies, uh, well, they had diseases. Oh, then they brought palm oil in, uh, oil palm in. So they, that's a kind of rotation you have now, whereas they could have avoided probably some of the diseases and other things by growing in different, in different ways. There are lots of externalized costs still in that system. And that's what we have to talk about. And you said palm oil isn't certified according to the concept of natural capital. That's, that's for one. And then, 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 of course, you went on and you took the example of dairy in the Netherlands. Uh, actually, we're, there you, you're shifting already to societal capital. It's not money anymore. It's a value of society and economic endeavors can contribute to creating that societal capital. That's what you're after, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, if we take that, and I'll go on to a, to a third question. 
Um, I just ask you, what can companies do? And what you are describing is an ecosystem. They should work as an ecosystem and they should try to work together as an ecosystem. Now we have in, in Europe this Green Deal by Franz Timmermans and it's very ambitious. It sounds very ambitious. There is a lot of criticism as well. And are there any metrics? Well, there are some ideas, but there aren't really any metrics. Suppose that, as should be the case probably, natural capital would be the basis for this Green Deal. What would be the role of companies? What would be the role of government? What would be the role of public, of us consumers? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, if you look at the global outlook for biodiversity that came out just before the summer, you, their conclusion was that basically you have to ha do all of that. Yeah? So um, consumers can change their consumption patterns and that will contribute a bit. But companies will have to uh, do different things. Uh, governments have to do different things. I think the Green Deal, uh, it's very important to have a good, uh, have high ambitions. And the criticism is, I think, less on the ambitions, ambitions itself, more about the speed and the way we get there. And once you agree about that, maybe yeah, some in the, in the agro business, maybe they don't all agree with that. But even there, I think many people agree. So that we have to go to a more sustainable way of uh, producing and living. Then it becomes a completely different question. Eh? So then, then the question is not about the ambition. It's about the way we get there. And then you have to open up. So as a government, you have to agree and, and uh, you have to communicate your uncertainty because you don't know how to do it alone. Companies, the same. Uh, consumers, the same. Uh, even nature organizations don't know how to do it. So once you share your uncertainty, but your common goal, you have a kind of different way of negotiating what the future is. And then you don't negotiate in the traditional Dutch way of polderen. Well, the traditional way of polderen is very good because you had an, a challenge in an, in an area, in which was a wetland, you had to drain it and you had to work together to achieve it. But nowadays to polder is, is basically limiting your own damage and not dreaming about the future and seeing how you get there. So if we achieve that, I think we are very creative, innovative. Many things will come up. Companies are more advanced often than governments because they lag behind. Other, on the other hand, governments can produce the framework for innovation and for the right directions. Right, so what you just said is, is also very important because uh, there is criticism of Timmermans as well. It's a communist system, they say, because it's top down. And you just said companies are very important to, to get this off because it, you need a lot of creativity. Could, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so it's, uh, in my opinion, it's not top down. I think the vision is, is from the center, from the government, from the EU, but also supported. By, so you have a very strong vision or a, a goal, but be, under, underneath that, you don't, um, you don't put it into rules and regulations completely. So you have a clear goal, but then you have to allow uh, this new partnership to develop and in innovate. So, and that's very difficult for government, in fact. So that's, uh, that's completely leaving it open and trusting that once you have set the, the ambition, the direction of innovations will go in, that, uh, in the right direction. Of course, you should phase out the things that are really against your future ambition. So it's not completely top down. In fact, I think there will be more freedom to develop more innovations if government uh, dares to to leave that room for society to develop so so you're saying and i see that peter is nodding uh, but you're saying uh, the vision indeed is is top down but the vision is you need a common goal and go off and do it uh, that, 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 that is what your, that is your advice. Yeah, and the vision, is not top down. And the vision is not even top down. We have in the Netherlands this Delta plan for biodiversity recovery. That's a shared vision from the financial institutions, the governments, national, local, from nature organizations, from the agribusiness, from all kinds of parties. In fact, we share 80, 90% of our ambition. So it's, even that is not really top down. So it's very simple, get a shared vision and get going.
yeah, but then government should should of course put this this framework in place where you have so that you have room for uh, innovation in the right direction, and where also the current the part that part those parts of the current system that are really against this uh, this ambition they are phased out, and that's what we struggle with, of course, always. And how strong are these uh, conservative forces? Um, if you say conservative forces are the forces that want to maintain the system, they are always very strong in any system, whether it being an academic system that needs to change or a business system or a government system or a family uh, system or cultural values, anything. So these forces are very strong. But to be honest, the, the forces towards uh, looking ahead are very strong as well, especially in business, because for them it is value and money. What I really want to add is kind of the notion that you mentioned before. Uh, um, there, there are mutual uh, dependencies. So you, you should look at it at, as, as a system or as an ecosystem. And in, as in any ecosystem, it depends on the interrelationships you have among each other. So it's, it's not a top-down regulated system or a fully bottom-up system. There are always interactions within our system because we, we depend on each other. So... Um, and those dependencies are both within the value chain, but also with respect to the uh, um, other things related to the landscape and the natural capital, uh, simply because things are decoupled over space. Um, so uh, like the example that Code gave, so if, if a farmer is regulating it, its water demands, it has impacts other, in, in other parts of the catchment. With, with probably other uh, stakeholders uh, and, 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 and people profiting from those, um, whether it's nature or society, that doesn't really matter in that case. So unless you look at it from a, a full landscape point of view as and a, in, in the integrated system, um, acknowledging that we need each other uh, in order to come up with with those solutions and to develop those solutions, uh, I think it, we're not going to get there. And 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 I, to my point of view, the reason why we don't have sort of solutions yet on the drawing table is because I, I think we will come up with new solutions if we acknowledge our current uncertainties and the current dependencies we have. And I think if you acknowledge that, then you can start with the innovations to get going. And, and, and that's, I think, one of the things that uh, is also central to kind of the approach that, that uh, is used for this biodiversity recovery plan that, that Koso is referring to. If you don't do that together, uh, I don't see anything working. So, and, and, and that implies that the government can't steer everything, but likewise, sort of the primary producers can't steer everything because then you miss other parts of the system that are important to this ambition too. Yeah. So in a way, it's uh, the funny thing is it's not like an ecosystem. An ecosystem doesn't have, the, the members in the ecosystem don't have a common purpose. They have their own goals. In fact, so I worked on, uh, on honeybee colonies a lot. So it's more like a honeybee colony. So the colony, they have a queen, but she doesn't have anything to say, a bit like uh, other monarchies in the world. But um, this colony has will not survive if they don't work together. And even though the members of the individual bees don't know exactly what the, what the common goal is, but they, the system works so that, uh, that they fulfill the goal and that anything against it will be detrimental. In an ecosystem, the uh, members eat each other and kill each other and uh, whatever. So it's very attractive to see it as an ecosystem, but the ecosystem lacks the common goal. And the difference with this Delta plan that I mentioned is that we first defined the common dream, ambition, or goal. And you have to be very strict in, in adhering to that goal. And that's what the Green Deal also does. It puts that, uh, that, that goal on the wall, basically. This is beautiful. Of course, what, what you're saying is it's a beautiful thing of, um, of collaboration, making people create the world and do it together. It's a Gesamtkunstwerk in a, yeah. in a way. You could call it like that. It's not natural. It's our creation even. Yeah. Uh, and that is, again, something that sets human beings apart from the rest of nature. But they have to take into account 
what nature does and that they depend on it. Now, one, one final question that is still, um, well, somehow it worries me. This society has come into being since uh, 10,000 years when we started out doing farming. Um, it took 10,000 years to evolve the way we did, to collaborate the way we did. And now we have to change. And I can see the system and your systems, guys. So I can see it. I can see the logic of the system. But are we capable of doing this? Because we're, we are fallible gods and we're not going to recreate ourselves in 10 years. What is your comment to that? I think this is the first time in our history that we can do it because we really can see the system. Because based on the data science, all the technologies we have and all that, we have a much better uh, approach to understanding the system. We are, we are closer to understanding the system and seeing the whole system. And we can even monitor uh, the things in detail, uh, see whether things go right or wrong. Uh, we can monitor biodiversity, but also income of people or happiness or whatever. So um, 10 years, 10,000 years ago, it was working because, well, mostly trial and error. But we have moved on from trial and error still, still quite a bit with our data science, with our big data approaches, our technologies. I think the combination is the only way we can, we can achieve that. So it's understanding the natural world and then applying um, the tools to really work with the system. Peter, do you agree? Yeah, I do agree. And, and to that, I would like to add thinking about the, the scenarios so we indeed, thanks to data science and, and, and molecular technologies, et cetera, et cetera, we can monitor things much better than we could even five years ago. Um, but we can only move forward if we put those in a systems perspective or a full landscape perspective to make predictions about whether that in the long run is going to contribute to our ambitions and, and, and be clear about our, our, our ambitions. I think nobody wants to destroy the planet. So I think we can be quite, I think there's indeed an overall agreement on those ambitions. But now the question is, how do we get there? And, and, and who has to get paid the bill? Uh, whether that's a financial bill or another value bill. Uh, um, and I think that's the main question. And the only way you can get there is to show what it does to all components of the system. Um, to avoid the externalization of costs, either to nature or other parties as we have been facing in the past. And that's why we work um, in specific landscapes also to achieve that. Because to, to make this work at the EU level or national level is quite a challenge. It's already a challenge in a landscape. So Peter and I are involved in several of these living lab, living landscape projects. And there basically we try to see, okay, what, what kind of measures or, or management works for biodiversity? Second, what works for the farmer or for the other uh, user? So what fits their system? So this is about business models. The third thing is, how will they act? How will, they, um, um, how will it become a movement? And which parties do we need? So what's about the social networks? So we build not only the ecological knowledge, but also the economic uh, systems and the social information. And only with these three together, you can build solutions like these, uh, these measurements of, uh, of rewarding and valuing uh, systems. So it's funny because we are ecologists, we look at systems, but um, we talk even, I think, sometimes more about business models and um, co-creation and, uh, and all these other things than about uh, our beloved bees and plants. I, I think it's important we collaborate with the other uh, uh, academic partners. And of course, the other academic partners are, are fully involved in the projects that that uh, Coast World was was referring to. Um, but I think what is important is that if we want to attain a, a, a sustainable society, you need to approach it from those multiple angles, from those multiple disciplines and, and work together and work together with the stakeholders and users involved to get things going. Uh, and, and if we would stick to our own ecology discipline, uh, I'm afraid nothing is going to happen. Yeah. I think that's kind of what, what Kos was trying to say there. Yeah. So we co-create and that's an... I don't, I'm not a big fan of that word, but we really determine what are our scientific questions together with the farmers and the government and uh, citizens and others in that landscape. And it's quite new also for us. 
and researchers have to get used to that as well. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Koos and, and, and Peter, for, for this interview. I think it's a beautiful interview in which you just really explain what the natural capital approach could be. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.